an absolutely incredible episode today with Coach Andy Plymer, the inventor and host of the Rugby Coaches Corner podcast, the best podcast on the planet for rugby coaches. And we go into the topics of what it takes to be an excellent coach and to have some cringe worthy moments to build your coaching practice off of. Stay tuned, folks. Hey, I'm going to fill you in on something. 70% of Canadians are vitamin D deficient. You need to get on that because more than likely you're deficient. And the reason why that's important is because vitamin D has been shown to help increase testosterone levels in men. But not only that, it helps reduce the severity of things like COVID-19 and respiratory disorders. How much do you need? You need about 3,000 IUs. The pills at the grocery store are not gonna do it. You've only got about 250 in there. You gotta be popping pills like a maniac. If you head to onit.com, you can check out their vitamin D3 spray and every spray is 250 IUs. I drink that stuff like nobody's business, like a baller in a club. So does my family because I want to make sure that we have awesome vitamin D levels during the winter months here in Canada. So if you head to onit.com and drop in Moro into the coupon area for your purchase, you're going to get a nice little discount just for listening to the podcast. You're welcome, by the way. So head to onit.com, drop in Moro for all your purchases, not just vitamin D and start living a healthier 2021 right away. Did you know that just for listening to the Hard to Kill podcast, you're going to get some perks? Yeah, that's right. The first perk that comes to mind is getting some really good, high-quality meat in you. So if you head to butcherbox.ca, you can get some grass-fed, grass-finished beef that is just top notch they got steaks they got burgers they got bones they got everything you need in order to consume some high quality meat and get some high quality protein into you so once you go to butcherbox.ca on your first order you can get 10 bucks off by dropping the code moro10 that's m-o-r-r-o-w-10 and get yourself some fresh awesome meat delivered right to your house today and start 2021 with some awesome meat go get welcome to the hard to kill podcast the go-to podcast for military leo and ems professionals sharing ideas and experiences from around the world to make you hard to kill here's your host dave morrow three two one Hey, folks. Today, we got Andy Plymer on the podcast. Uh, if you guys are unaware, Andy's the reason why I got into podcasting. Not only that, he has, and I'm going to say it, Andy, I hope you're okay with this, the premier, the world's best rugby coaching podcast out there, the Rugby Coaches Corner. So it's awesome to have him on. It's been like, I've been doing this almost three years and I haven't had you on. I've been on yours, but now finally you're on mine. So welcome uh, welcome to the podcast, bro. And why don't you give the listeners just a little taste of what you're all about? Thanks, man. Um, yeah, no, I I had noticed that you hadn't had me on the podcast in two years. So uh, you know, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't think that, uh, you know, was flying under the radar or anything like that. Um, no, man, it's uh, it's great to be on. And, uh, you know, I love, love what you're doing and, um, you know, you're going all in on it. So uh, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So backstory of me, I'm from Australia originally. Um, grew up like any LZ kid, kind of playing loads of different sports, um, surfed a lot climbed trees a lot, rode bikes and played rugby league and then switched over to rugby union. And then that became uh, my main sport of passion. But, you know, throughout my 20s, I kind of dipped in and out of it, doing other things, played in the band for a bit. Uh, I was going to make it big in the punk scene, Uh, you know, all those those great things that you do when you're at uni. Um, But, yeah, rugby was always there. Um, And so I just ended up falling back into it Um, and then – you know, when I moved to Canada, which was probably 14 years ago, uh, that's when my coaching started. And I basically, I remember 20 years ago saying, I'm never going to be a coach. Why would anyone want to do that? Um, it looks horrible. Uh, and, and now, and now it's like, that's like most of my mental bandwidth is taken up with, with coaching and, uh, you know, and other things like brewing beer and, uh, bird watching and, you know, all, all that good stuff. Um, the kids and the family, of course, um, 
and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shout out. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so it, I was a player coach um, for a couple of years, which was incredibly challenging. Uh, it just makes coaching even more difficult. Uh, it's already difficult. Uh, and when you're, you know, I'm a pretty emotional guy on the field. I, 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 I read line pretty quickly for as soon as that whistle goes so, so i've heard I, so i've heard <laughs> who have you been talking to um yeah some, so, some kiwi guy uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah not not that reliable um <laughs> and yeah so that was another challenge i learned so much about myself uh not only coaching but myself as you know what 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 triggers me and what what gets me going and those kind of things um and then and then i stopped playing I'm 45 now, so I stopped playing at 40. Um, so I was actually a player coach, and then I was just a player, but I was doing a bunch of rep coaching of, of junior age grade stuff outside of it. Um, and then, yeah, the, the podcast kind of started almost six years ago. Oh, I think it is six years. No, six years in September. Um, wow. Yeah. And that was, do you want me to talk about that? or? Well, the, uh, so there's, you touched on, a lot of, <laughs> touched on a lot of good things yeah. there. The fact that you're like let's, a let's raving savage. Yeah, that you're a raving savage on the rugby pitch. Like that's, I think we'll leave that one aside. Uh, you know, it's just rumors. I've never seen you. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to see you in action. It's I just rumors. heard the rumors. Yeah. So we'll keep, we'll leave it at that. Um, I was a good bench of, warmer at a representative <laughs> level. So we can, we can leave it at that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. But the, um, the, I think you brought up something where, you know, you never really thought that you'd ever want to be a coach. Like you thought that like just not be something you'd want to do. I think it kind of, it's kind of like when you're a young and 20 year old dude and you're looking at dads, they're married, like three kids. And you're like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Why would I do that? Driving a minivan. Driving yeah. a minivan. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like I got like a, I got like a badass golf right now. Like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know, like, um, and then all of a sudden you're in it and you're like, man, well, how did I do anything but this? This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the, well, sorry, I, I say it with a grain of salt. I'm kind of, I think we're all in the juice right now uh, with young kids. So, um, mm. but definitely, um, definitely interesting that you kind of stumbled into coaching and it wasn't just one of those things that you were initially passionate about. So what kind of led to that first, oh shit, like, was it the fact that there was nobody stepping up to the plate and you're like, I might as, I might as well do this because nobody else is going to do it. Or was somebody like, okay, I need you as a coach. Let's, let's get you, let's get you doing some reps and, and, and coaching this team. Yeah, it was kind of um, a bit of both really. Um, I, I came here in 2003 to play rugby and then I went back and that's where I met my, my wife, Jen. And then I went back to Australia for three years, but two years into that, we reconnected and we're doing long distance and it just worked out. It was easier for me to move uh, to Montreal than uh, for Jen to move to Australia. So part of the thing was I was going to come and play. And uh, they said, hey, we, we need, the club said, we need a coach. Would you be keen? And I'm like, uh, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so I, I just came up. I didn't really give it much thought. I'm like, I'm just going to coach. That should be easy, right? That's like everyone's coach. You know, I've been now, coach, is that so Is I that don't... more of a like, is that more of a like, well, He's Australian. He must know more than us kind of deal where like if I were to go to Australia and they'd be like, hey, can you coach the hockey team? And I'd be like, well, I guess. I mean, I'm I'm sure that would be like my reaction if somebody asked me in Australia to coach a hockey team. I've never really done it, but okay. There's There's a bit of that for sure, which is which is not right, because there are some fabulous Canadian born coaches here um, in in our province, uh, but but nationally as well. And you know, it's a bit of a bit of a thing that grinds my gears a bit. Is that we are just on a revolving door of international coaches at at the representative level, um, and we we have no homegrown coaches uh, at a at a senior senior men's level at least. Um, and you know, the the women's team uh, has a Canadian coach, um, but. Yeah, there's there's some really good coaches here, so it's like it's it's unjustified for you know hey you got an accent you must you must know the game because <laughs> to be honest when I started coaching I, I I knew how to play my position or my two positions okay I was, Which you was know, I wasn't hook, I was, hooker, I was right? never 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I, 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 for those most of us in this realm probably don't know the positions yet, so it's it's an actual yeah. position. I'm not I'm not I'm not making light of the position. No, I, I played any position really in the back line over you know thirty years of playing, but um, probably uh, in my later playing stage, I realized that you know I was actually a scrum half. Um, I started playing on the wing uh, when I was fast. Uh, but then, you know, slowly move close to the ball as the speed drops out. But yeah, I realized pretty quick. I didn't know any, like a lot about rugby. I knew a little bit about certain positions, but I didn't know a lot about, um, you know, the forwards. What, what do they do? What do they do in set piece? Um, so it was a good learning experience. And, and I suppose the thing that got me right into it was initially I was coaching for me. I was, I was coaching for personal success. I wanted to win a, win a cup. I'd never won a cup. Up. Uh, the only time I had a chance to win a cup, I was dropped the week before and was on the bench and didn't actually get to play in that game. Um, so, and that things, yeah, no, and no, I didn't. I handled it very, very poorly. Um, and so, I that was kind of my driving motivation, which is which is not a good place to be. I was I was all about just winning this championship, and so I was coaching uh, really poorly. I was coaching to a point where I I would not have wanted to be coached by me. Um, and, and it took probably two years for me to realize after some, you know, some battles and some, you know, turmoil and things like that, I I had to really change my ways. And, um, so, you know, the first book that I read that really impacted me was, uh, Any Given Team by Ray McLean. Uh, and it's all about, you know, creating a trademark for the team, setting behaviours, um, peer reviewing based on those behaviours. He actually based it on the Australian um, Australian Air Force, a uh, special fighter group uh, in the Air Force. He, he designed it from that. He was a phys ed teacher as well. Um, and I read that and I'm just like, man, I am doing everything wrong. I was super top down. Um, my, 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 my coaching sessions were, were decent enough because I, I was phys ed trained and so I, you know, keep them moving, keep them make it game specific and games based and those kind of things still needed to work on that. But, you know, the, the man management as they call was, was very poor. Um, so turning that and turning it into an athlete centered coaching model was, was huge for me. Um, so that was, that was, that was pretty, pretty big. There's a lot of parallels there. Like for you folks that are listening, um, me and Andy actually worked at the same school for about six years um, in Montreal. I was your mentor. He, he was, he was, thank God you were, man. I, cause you're showing up to the school. Uh, I've had a lot of bad experiences. This one was not that bad experience. I was like, oh sweet. There's an Aussie on staff and he's my mentor <laughs> for sure. This guy likes to drink. <laughs> um, How dare you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that was in an era where stereotyping was okay. And now we've just yeah, got to yeah. another point where that, I guess is just inappropriate. So um, <laughs> the, the whole idea that, you know, you take a team and you want to lead it to, to glory, to success, you know, mm. there's a lot of parallels in, in the military, whether you have a, you know, a small section of, you know, seven to 10 individuals or a platoon or a company, whatever, like as, as it gets bigger, you know, you have a bit more um, responsibilities in the sense that you have more people, but the principles stay the same. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, you learn them through, you know, some formal courses or you actually learn them like you did during mm. the actual process. And you're, mm. you're intellectual enough, I guess, to, say, okay, I need, you know what, there's something off. I'm not doing things right. And I need mm. to kind of drill down into what it is. And you found a book, uh, which, um, you know, any good leader knows you got to lead, you got to learn from those that came before you because their knowledge mm. is, is there it's available. So, uh, yeah. it's cool that you, 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 you recognize that and you started improving your process. Um, and that's very similar to what we do in the military as well. Um, good leaders are always reading. They're always reading. They're mm. always improving mm. the way they do shit because that was me like the first few years. Like, I, and you know, you're probably a bit older than when I had my first section, but I remember when I first became a leader, I was just emulating what I saw before me, which is what we call louder ship, which wasn't, yeah. you know, wasn't really like troop focused. It was basically like, that's I'm what most coach. people do when they're coaching, they coach how they were coached. And right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I remember really like, if, if you don't, if you, if you look back at, you know, your, I can't remember where I heard this from, but if you look back and you don't kind of cringe at the things that you you've done, Ooh. then that means you haven't really grown. Right. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. I look back yeah, and I'm like, oh, they, like, so one uh, specific moment, I remember I was, I had a, I had a few sections of guys and we're, we're doing drill 
and uh, we drill Mike, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's essentially like marching around the parade square. Okay. So, um, sounds awesome. Yeah. It's, 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 it's beauty. Actually, I've got a permanent tan line on my neck and my arm from it. So anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and sore knees, uh, no big deal. So I remember one guy was just out of line. He was just, I don't know. He just wasn't focused. It was hot, whatever. Um, and I remember pulling him aside and just like dressing him down and like swearing and got my knife hand out. And yeah. then another more senior guy came over. He's like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm sorting this guy out. He's like, do you really think this is going to improve his like, performance? Like he, you're embarrassing him in front of everybody. And then he just left. And I was like, Fuck. I was like, yeah, it's true. And I remember yeah. from that point on, I was kind of like, wow. Yeah. That was, that was like, that 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 really kind of put me in a position where i was like yeah am i what like why am i doing this This isn't even me as a person i don't do this this is very uncharacteristic of me but i'm doing what i think i should be doing yeah but it wasn't but it was wrong so um you know yeah you got to be authentic yeah you got to be authentic and i'm not a mm. yeller and i remember yelling mm. and i remember like things yeah. coming out of my mouth and spitting and i was like man i i don't even know <laughs> what i'm saying this this i sound like a <laughs> crazy person yeah. um so you know for you like when you were coaching um, you know, did you have that moment or was it something oh, sure. more, was it something more of like a gradual progression where you're like, okay, I, I'm seeing the difference because the guys on the field and my team, they're coming together and they're actually ha mm. having a better performance. Yeah. There was a bunch of little moments that led to the change, but there was probably two big ones. Um, all both happened in the same game. Uh, I was playing uh, fly half and probably the best rugby player I've played with was playing nine. Um, this is in my. This is year two of my play coaching uh, time. So my second year of coaching. Um, the scrum half uh, offered some advice for some tactical decisions, and um, I quote: uh, "This is not a democracy." Is what came out of my mouth. <laughs> I used that one he too. Said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's still. Um, <laughs> We're mates. We're still mates. He's a good bloke. Uh, he still takes a piss out of me now because of that. And, um, yeah, it was an away game. It was a horrible game. We grinded out a really ugly win. Um, but it was at a tough field where we didn't win a lot of games and we should have been really happy. And the other moment was, like, tight head prop, stall order of the club. I see him leaving, say bye to him, and he just looked absolutely miserable. And it was like, man. Yeah, it was just you got to you got to get you, those cringeworthy moments. You got to have them, otherwise you don't grow, you don't develop. And you, the worst thing you can do as a coach is think that you know everything, um, because you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna have a fall. Um, and if you're not um, you know self aware enough um, to, to develop and grow from that, um, you 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 won't get better. So yeah, that kind of led me to the 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 player centered focus, and then um, yeah, it was just. After that, after I implemented that, it was it was crazy. Just the the switch in the the attitude from me, but also the players and watching them actually kind of it's like a you know forming, norming, storming, performing kind of stages where you know first of all they're like, okay, he's read something. What's going on here? Are we going to stick with this? And then it's like, hey, we're actually doing this, and and it's a process, and we're, we're getting it's we're we're part, starting to do this, and then. Some people are like, fuck this, I don't want to do this. But most people are saying, yes, this is the way we do it. So you're either, you know, you're going to have 5% that will never fit, uh, 30, 25% that will get pulled over by the other 30, 70%. Oh, math struggling there. Um, but you know what I mean? Um, and then, and then when, you hit that, when you hit that performing stage, uh, it's just a lot of fun. You, you are actually doing zero, borderline zero leadership at that point. You're, you're more... Um, I hate the word facilitating. It's a real buzzword, uh, but that's essentially what you're doing. You're you're just taking the temperature of the group. Uh, of course, you're designing the session plans and you know the technical tactical side of the game. But in terms of motivating the group and um, uh, driving performance, it's by that stage. You're, it's the players that are doing it for themselves, um, and. That's for me. That's the best part of coaching. I love forming a team. I love going through those little roller coaster moments because I know at the end where it's going to be, um, and it's just a it's a fun fun journey, and that's what keeps me doing it for sure. So, yeah, what do you do to get in to get that buy in? Do you have a do you have a a, a, a protocol? Because you mm. read something and like this is awesome. I got to implement mm. this. But like you said, you know, like you ha you you only ha you have like the early adopters, like any organization, mm. right? It, it, mm. if, if you're a leader, you bring in a new idea to the table. Like you said, you know, you have that like 25, 75 split. What do you do to to 
to get those like the whole organization or the whole team to kind of buy into that new vision that yeah. you've just decided you're going to start implementing. Let me interrupt you for one hot minute because I want to make sure that you're tracking that the Nimble Warrior second edition is going to be launching on July 17th, 2021. The book has got all kinds of new updates. It has got new workouts. Additionally, there's a companion course that goes with it. Guys, I'm not lying when this is going to be the best seller of 2021. <laughs> I'm just joking. But if you do want to get on the pre-sell list, all you need to do is go to davemorrow.net slash nimble. Okay, davemorrow.net slash nimble. Get yourself on the pre-sale list. This is the only way that you're going to get the exclusive sneak peeks and exclusive, exclusive discounts to get your hands on this book before it launches. So that's davemorrow.net slash nimble. Find out all the tricks of the trade to get out of the pain cave, sort out your bad back, sort out your shitty knees. This is all covered in the Nimble Warrior 2nd Edition coming out on July 17th. All right, guys, back to the show. Yeah, well, it's, it's, the first thing is it's got to be their vision. It can't be your vision um, because you're not you're not playing. You're not on the field. And even when I was playing and I did this, I I, I stepped back. I was like, no, I'm the coach. I'm you guys are the players, and um, you you make these calls. But yeah, if you if you follow Ray McLean's method, is create a trademark. So basically, you you ask a few questions. How do you think people view us as a team? Um, write some of those things up, good and bad. How do we want to be viewed as a team at the end of this season? And now let's mash all those words together and let's come and let's get a, like a five word trademark um, that, that encompasses all those feelings and emotions. Um, so uh, the last one I did was uh, work hard, have fun, win. Um, that was the last group came up with that with the Montreal Irish, which when I was coaching them uh, two, two years ago, three years ago. Um, I didn't like the win part because I don't like focusing on outcomes, but that's they wanted that in there. So it's like, okay, that's that's what you want to do. Um, once they've done the trademark, it's, okay, what are, what are behaviors that we can see and measure that determine whether we're actually doing this trademark, achieving this trademark or attempting to achieve it, or it's just like a, a, something written on the wall that we stuck up in the changing rooms. So I create behaviors around practice, around game day, and around the 24 hours um, leading up to, to, to the match. Um, behaviors are great, but you got there's got to be a certain level of accountability there. So that's the, the third piece comes in is the peer review. So you're not, you're not going around with a big stick whacking people um, when they're, when they're not, adhering to these behaviors the players are conducting peer review sessions and you can do it in a number of ways like i actually the first time i do it i started off anonymous uh, uh, but then i started in uh, pairs uh, and then small groups or units and and you can do it a bunch of different ways i've even done like a speed dating two circles where they get a minute at each person to to peer review and how peer review works is you've got to give someone a positive and, and a uh, and if you for the work ons, um, well, peer review. What happens in peer review stays in peer review. So once it's done, it's done. Uh, there's no grinding the teeth afterwards or, or anything like that. Um, and then for the work on, when you're given a work on, you can't justify it. So you can't say, yeah, well, I was having a bad day that day. That's why I lost my shit on the field. It's because if you justify it, you're just going to repeat that behavior again. Mm. So that's a standing rule where if someone gives you feedback, it because it's affecting them as one of your teammates um, and, and you you need to take that on board and think about how you're going to course correct um, or you're not going to course correct and then there's going to be consequences further down the down the track. Right. Um, yeah, once you've got that, that peer review going, um, even at the same time as a peer review, you, you get the players to elect the leadership group and they're, they're your kind of three or four players um, that are taking the temperature of the team and reporting back to you um, and you're meeting with them all the time. You're texting them, you're WhatsApping them, you're you know always touching base to see what what the team's like. And then if there's issues that they don't feel they can handle, they then come to you, um, mm. and you, that's when you step in. You're the you, you're the last person to step in to solve the problems um, because that's what rugby is, right? It's a it's a bunch of problems that you got to solve in 80 minutes. Um, so if you're always solving them as a coach, that that makes no sense. Right. Yeah. It's very similar to 
there's, there's a lot of things that are very similar to how a an experienced army unit work functions. Mm-hmm. Cool. A lot of, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people just assume, like you said, this isn't a democracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they'll just do it because yeah, you told yeah. them to. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. some units, yeah, at, at, at the small unit level, sometimes that works. And it depends sometimes on the age of your, you know, how experienced your unit. If you got a bunch of really young. Yeah, habits, I agree. Yeah. You know, like it, 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 it could be hard. Right. And that's why mm-hmm. the, the experienced corporal is kind of like your, your go-to and you always usually have a second in command. Mm-hmm. That's, that's got an, enough experience as well, but depending on your, how experienced you guys are and girls, you can really, you can really go with that approach. But it, again, it's, it's, it's something that this can apply to any team that you're building. It doesn't have to be a, mm. a, a rugby team or a sports team. Yeah, the, the leader leadership, leadership is leadership and good leadership is good leadership, whether you're on the battlefield or whether you're on the rugby pitch. Mm. Um, and I like that five word mm. slogan. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, folks, when I used to see Andy coaching, you always had this little notebook and I don't know if you, you still do. <laughs> still do. Uh, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I piled them all up and they were as big as my son when he was three years old. <laughs> so you used. must have a shit ton of those <laughs> notebooks, man. Cause like, yeah. Like they're the smallest notebooks I've ever yeah. seen. And they're just yeah. what little Hillroy's. Yeah. I get them at the dollar store. And you just skin, mate. Yeah. Okay. Moleskin. Okay. So yeah, they're, yeah, they're high end. quality. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I really knocked you down a peg. Like a dollar store bullshit. <laughs> yeah. um, probably tissue. Probably not writing anything. Yeah. Just drawing circles all the time. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, you're, you're consistently taking notes. Mm. And I had, a, I had a really good platoon commander early on in my career. He had a lot of experience and he created this whole new kind of section at our unit to do some extra training. And um, we loved it. And he was able to just kind of boil things down and, and build the team, kind of like you're doing right now uh, mm-hmm. with your teams. Um, but he, he had something really poignant that always stuck with me is that, look, if, if your leadership or your direct supervisor is asking you to do things and wants some feedback, but just sits there and doesn't actually record anything, you don't notice them writing Mm. anything down. Odds Mm. are they don't give a shit. Mm. So they're just doing it because they feel like they have to. And there's nobody Mm. on the planet that can possibly record and and take in all the information that's coming from a a unit or a team and actually be able to action it if they haven't written it down because five minutes after it's happened it's gone and there's no way that you can actually action it so um that that's that's one thing that i I took away from you and when i was doing um my ted lasso you seen that is that that tv is that is that the comedy with what's his name? Yeah. Uh, Sudeikis. I don't know who the dude is. He's brilliant though. Is- but um, <laughs> that was his first thing. Was like he's an American coaching uh, English soccer, and uh, knows nothing about the game. But uh, his first coaching moves was to put a put a um, suggestion box in the change room, and <laughs> people would write stuff on it. And he opened it up. The first ten suggestions were just people calling him a wanker, um, and then <laughs> the the tenth suggestion or the eleventh suggestion was. Uh, the, the water pressure sucks in this building. So he's like, right, let's fix the water pressure. And just that little action of a player voicing that I've got an issue, it's affecting me. Mm-hmm. And then the coach finding a way to solve that, um, solve that issue. Um, that's massive because you can write all the stuff down, but if, if nothing comes of it, it's, you know, you've wasted everyone's time as well. So there's yeah. got to be, there's got to be a full, full loop there. Yeah. You got to see, yeah, there has to be a connection between, if they if they decide okay like we're talking about buy in if you don't if you don't create that that link between the players or the team doing something that you're asking them to do and you actioning it now you've yeah. lost them forever because they're going to say well whatever they asked me to do or he asked me to do it's not yeah. going to get action so why am i going to do anything um, or so- if you don't role model what they're asking you what you're asking them to do mm. or they're asking themselves to do so if you know if one of your behaviors on game day is to remain disciplined and and you know, not not engaged with the referee, which is a, has been a big challenge for me uh, from a coaching standpoint. And then you go and do it as a coach, um, you're you're losing credibility there. So, and that's happened to me before, where it's like we want to be a really disciplined team, and then I'm on the sideline having a bad day, and we're we're human, and that's going to happen, and we're fallible. But what you got to do after that is you got to get the playing group to, together and say, look, I, that's on me. I'm, I'm sorry. I went against our trademark behaviors. I'm going to get better. And then you, you prove to them that you are actually going to 
get better by by performing uh, next time. Um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, it takes, you, takes you, a lot you of can't be You can't be on your pedestal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it takes a time. And I actually journey. did that. I did that um, in 2018 and I got an email from a from a player who'd been playing hockey and rugby for 20 years. He said he's never had a, a coach apologize to him as a, as a player. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's like, yeah, man, you must have had uh, some fun times then. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, like as soon as you're in that, that leadership role, the, I guess the, the perception is that you're infallible and that mm. you have to project this aura of perfection. Yeah. And if you show any weakness, you're then going to be preyed upon and you're going to be yeah. torn apart and somebody's going to like usurp your, your authority. Yeah. But in reality, that's not the case at all. Like if you, if you're, if you're able to show yeah. that you're human, odds are your, you know, your team, your unit, whatever will, will, will get stronger because it'd be like, Hey, this guy's solid. Like he's able to admit mistakes and we're able to move on from there and let's giddy up and let's get after it. So yeah. um, one of the best things you can say is, I don't know. What do you think? And you know, you, you, you can't, you can't know everything. Like I don't know everything about line outs and scrums, uh, but I, I know what I want to see, but I don't know technically how to do it. I don't know everything about the breakdown. I don't know everything about backs plays, but it's like, I don't know. What do you, what do you think we should do here? And then, you know, that's, that's empowering the players as well too. They own whatever you're, you've asked them feedback on. So they're going to, yep. they're going to have a real crack. Like oh, in, in coaching the backs, there's, First phase is basically off a, off a line out or a scrum, and often it'll come to the backs. Um, most of the time they'll drop the ball, uh, but sometimes they'll catch it. I'm joking. Uh, it's a rugby joke. Uh, all forwards in the world <laughs> like will get that. <laughs> I, I saw the look. I, I know my audience. Um, I'm like on that one. <laughs> anyhow, so, so off off that first phase, it's a great place to uh, to run set plays where you have you know multiple moving parts and you know what you're doing, but the opposition don't. I I haven't I haven't instructed a group in probably five years to run a backs play i i get them to design the plays and then come and talk to me what i do is i i say okay here's the field in this part of the field i want to be attacking this this area give me give me three plays that are going to attack that field. when we're close to their line i want to be attacking this part of the field give me give me three plays there make sure the plays have options to include everyone in that back line there's there's seven backs um, so give, give me options so that everyone can have a crack at, you know, trying to score or trying to make a line break or something like that. But I, I, I don't do any of that. I don't, some coaches love it. The X's and O's and what, and like, you know, tell me what it is. Tell me why you're doing it, but make sure we're doing it in the area that I, I, I know is a weak spot for this team. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, yeah. And Very then cool. you can theme, theme around what, what, what moves you want to call, what, what names they're going to be called. Um, and it's, it's all on the players. Very cool. Um, so on that note, um, seeing as this is a, um, fitness health podcast, yeah, so to speak, uh, what then do you do with your team? Because yeah, I mean, I, I presume all the teams or the majority of your teams that you've coached don't have a dedicated strength and conditioning coach. Yeah, like you're, right. you're, you're the, you're the tactical mm. strategic and, you know, strength and conditioning coach for everything. So you're yeah. like the guy and you, you most likely have, you know, like somebody else, like an assistant with you, but what do you do then? You've, you've sorted out, you know, you've got your strategy, you're working on your tactics on the field, but like your team has to be fit. Um, yeah. So what do you typically do for a rugby team? Because it's a, it's a demanding sport and it's brutal. So, mm-hmm. you know, where do you, where do you even start? Um, I guess it, you know, I mean, like depending on age, it mostly start at the beginning. Teen. Like, where do you, yeah. What do you, wh- what do you do? <laughs> um, well, you got to profile the sport to start with. Like, so, so rugby, you, you need, you need some strength, you need some uh, muscular endurance, maximal strength. Um, you need speed, you need power and you need cardiovascular endurance to, to, keep all those those systems working um so and then it's about periodizing uh, and it's like i'm no expert at this um and you're right it's it's amateur level rugby so often you're jack of all trades master and none better than being a master one kind of thing um so you so you do have to get creative and and think like that but you know if, if you're going to periodize it you're you're, you're going to be thinking okay off season um off season is players working on on their strength um 
we don't have the budget for a facility or a strength coach or anything like that. So we have to get creative like that. So we formed a relationship with a, with a local CrossFit um, and they do a bunch of the programming. Obviously there's conversations with us. Um, you rely heavily on the older guys, the leaders to, to drag the younger guys there um, to, to make sure they're, they're lifting. Um, and then preseason is essentially getting that cardio base Um I, I I don't think I'm alone when I say I hate preseason as a player. I think most players don't enjoy the fitness work except if they're ex army masochists uh, that, that love that stuff. Um, More shout PT. Out, shout out to Kobe Archer there. He uh, he was a real grinder. He loved it. Um, yeah. So I really want to. My big thing is I I won't run the guys for the sake of running. I'll run them because there's a plan and I'll share that plan with them. This is why we're doing this. So, you know, getting that cardio base, you, know, you might do, you know, some old school fart leg training or, you know, you, you got to get some, some miles under the, under the belt. Uh, but then there's a bit of a trend now in rugby. It's called a Bronco where it's a 20, 40, 60 shuttle five times. Hmm. Um, that is a good way of getting some volume in but not absolutely wrecking the guys as well. So it, it's maybe good players will do it sub five. Um, your, your tight five players will do it six or more. Um, you know, you really good players. Six or more minutes to, minutes. to okay. do that round. Okay, so that's that's a good way just to, to get some volume in that doesn't just, just ruin them for two days. Um, so I, I do kind of do that, but I also like um, Dan Baker's approach, which is all about maximal aerobic speed. Um, which is basically training for really short intervals at 100, 120% of your maximal aerobic speed. So basically you, you can work out what your aerobic speed is by doing a 12-minute run. Um, so go as hard as you can for 12 minutes. How many kilometers can you do? We can convert that now into meters per second. Then once you've got your groups in meters per second, like groups, say four groups, you're then, you can then have them run a distance that you know, so that's their hundred percent maximal speed. Um, you can now have a distance that they can run at that is one hundred and twenty percent of their maximal speed. So it might be like the the strongest group is running ninety meters. The the weakest group is running you know seventy eight meters. Um, if you type in, if you search Dan Baker Mac, uh, MAS, the first article uh, that pops up, read that. It's amazing. Um, so I'm basically, I, I, when I do it with my guys, I call it six minutes of fun. Uh, so it's basically, you have 30 seconds to get to this end. Uh, sorry, you have 15 seconds to get to this end, which is 120% of your maximum aerobic speed. You get 15 seconds rest and then you got 15 seconds to get back and you repeat that for six, six minutes total. You can, oh. you can block it and periodize. Yeah. It's, it's no fun, but That's again, dirty. it's like, it's your, your like, jacking up that that um those expectations on the cardiovascular endurance system but you're doing it for short intervals uh you get loads of adaptation um and again i'm not an snc coach or anything like that so there's probably people who who don't use mas i just found it a, a really useful tool uh for my setting um i think that um and then i suppose um speak I was just going to say this is go. going to be this is going to be something dirty. I always like hearing these new uh, these new kind of modalities or these new kind of uh, ways to to set up a, a testing baseline. Uh, so for my clients, I think yeah. they're 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 in for a little tasty treat coming up with the the MAS. It's going to be good. Yeah, it's it's worth a it's worth a read. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways you can you can roll it out, whether it's a straight line running or or a box or um, the one I use is called Eurofit. Um, terrible name, but you know, that's that. If you read the article, that's the one I, I use a lot. Um, and then, uh, like my big focus, like there has to be a big focus on speed and power, uh, throughout the season. Um, and so I, that's where I really want a dedicated coach to, to, to roll that out. And for me, it's been a player. Um, I've, I've had some sprint coaches earlier on and they were great. Um, and just right now it's a, it's a player who's, he's passionate about it and he, he leads that. But we plan it together. Um, so you're doing, you know, progressively, you're building up to maximal reps with short, with a lot of rest time. 
Um, that's really hard. The guys don't like the rest time. They want to just keep going. And so, so we've, we've started in dispersing um, some skill work in between there, some stationary skill work or, you know, just, just to make them get the reps in so they actually get them in at 30 or two minutes rest, whatever it be on a day. Uh, you don't need a lot of equipment. I like making it really competitive, um, especially mm-hmm. at the end when they can really go hard. Um, but you've got to be super careful. You've got to make sure they are conditioned for it because there is a lot of force moving through the joints uh, when you are running at your maximal speed. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just don't don't go in thinking you're going to do max efforts first session. You, you really have to build to that and yep. be comfortable. Because basically if you have an out-of-contact injury in rugby, like a hamstring, it's it's your fault. Like as the coach, it, it's your fault. You, you, haven't, you haven't prepped the players uh, well enough. You've stressed them too much. You haven't let them recover. And as a result, they're either they're either adapting to what you're giving them, or they're they're you know recovering from from the the training and mm-hmm. and intense physical training makes you worse at rugby, like because you can't perform at your best. So you have to really be um, aware of that when you're when you're periodizing this. And and with that in mind, that's why I do contact and speed work on a Thursday night rather than traditionally a lot of people would do it on a Tuesday night. Um, you're in an amateur setting. You have not fully recovered from your game on Saturday by Tuesday, and you're you're screaming out for an injury. Um, hmm. So, a lot of people will be like, "Oh, but Thursday's really close to the game." Just manage the volume, keep the intensity high, but keep the the volume low. There's no reason why um, senior men's rugby should be doing more than ten minutes full contact on a Thursday night. Like it's just not necessary. Um, and you, if you concussion background. Uh, would 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 know a, a bit about that that you know often we're we're just putting kids in situations that they're not physically prepared for uh, and and that's on the coach like you've got to educate mm-hmm. yourself around that yeah um yeah cool cool to know like yeah obviously you know you've been doing this for a while and there's a lot of similarities in the sense that we have you know if you're if you're a leader of a team in the military uh, you know a section let's say you're basically their PT coach with zero training, but very few have any background. Um, our leadership course has a, a small little module on like how to run a, a PT session, which by default, if you don't know anything, you go for a run because every human being can run <laughs> everybody, every human being can do some pushups, but, um, you know, knowing how to periodize and how to actually build the fitness of your small unit and at a bigger level, how to do it is very much uh, abdicated to, you know, on the basis, um, our, actual PT coaches, but they don't have the time to, to work individually with, you know, platoons or companies mm. and stuff like that. They kind of do it mm. like as, as on an as needed basis. And so knowing that balance and knowing how to push guys to, you know, point where they're, they're gaining fitness, but not incurring injuries comes with a mm. lot of experience and a lot of reading, man. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, and yeah. especially when you're doing maximal efforts. Yeah. You, you got to build up. I mean, and especially I found, you know, with, with younger guys, right? Like if you're in your twenties and it's like, okay, we're doing a competition. Well, if you haven't built yeah. up that volume, they're going to go all out and they're going to, they're going to blow a knee. They're going to blow a hamstring because yeah. You, yeah. why, why wouldn't you? It's like in your mind, you're like, yeah, but I don't want to lose. I don't care if I'm out for two months. Yeah. I don't want to lose. So <laughs> you have to temper that. You have to be like, all right, all right. Cause yeah. I've seen I, all my injuries that I've seen have all been like either from ball hockey or playing basketball or and all just for shits and gigs, not for anything related to mm. work, just for shits and gigs and mm. not competitive. So um, I like that you, that you brought that up. And, you know, for the strength and conditioning stuff, I learned a lot from you in the sense that, um, you know, some of the programs that you've, um, you've you know, showed me anyways, you know, the Wendler uh, protocol, of five, yeah. that's five weeks, I believe. And then there's the, um, yeah. the triphasic. Five, three, one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah five, three, one. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah I, Cal I, 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 Cal Deets yeah, is Cal Yeah. Man, so yeah, yeah. you know, I'll, I'm going to drop those in the show notes because I think they're they're just mm. awesome, awesome baselines to to start with. Like if you're looking for maximal strength development, uh, that's what those are my go tos, um, and that's what yeah. I do with my clients. Against I my think uh, Mike Mike Boyle as well. Um, Which one's that? He's got some uh, Mike Boyle. I uh, can't remember what he's, uh, he's he's his books like legendary in the S and C. So legendary, I can't remember it. Uh, but it's basically <laughs> if you if you don't know how to coach a squat or a Romanian deadlift, you got to read Mike Boyle's book because the, mm. the processes that he has his athletes go through and the the progressions and regressions. Uh, it, it it that one taught me a lot as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll drop something we'll about that sports in there. sports specific coach training or, or something. 
on okay. that. So I can't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. You have to educate yourself as soon as you're, as soon, even if you don't want the responsibility, as soon as you have the responsibility, you gotta, you gotta do some reading and you gotta to reach out to some people. And that's basically where I got my start. Right. I was just, I was a mm. neophyte. I didn't know anything. I knew, I knew what I knew from my dad from going into the gym and doing like Arnold Schwarzenegger style workouts. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when it comes preacher to curls. performance, yeah. Preacher curls, a lot of, a, a lot of leg press machine, you know, like yeah. just the a bench press, that's you know, good. like the, the basics, but you know, that was, that was the start, but there's so much more to it, especially mm. when you're talking performance, when it's not just like show muscles, you know, you mm -hmm. want to actually be able to perform as a soldier yeah. or as a rugby player. Like it takes a, it takes a lot more in-depth yeah. analysis. Um, so Andy, before we get to the end of our conversation here, which could go on probably for another two hours, yeah. um, I wanted to make Crack sure that, beer. yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's almost, oh, it's almost 11. It's beer clock. Yeah. It's beer clock. <laughs> yeah. uh, 11 PM in Australia though. <laughs> <laughs> um you've got an interesting project on the go mm. and uh i was hoping that you'd be able to uh to share with the folks uh, on the podcast big scoop big scoop man <laughs> is this the first time that you drop the this info? yeah yeah no i've been uh pretty uh down low with the with the whole thing but i don't see any point uh in keeping it down low no. yeah so just a backstory um on the podcast I, I i started it six years ago almost six years ago um, basically, because I was I was working at the school that we taught at, I was teaching a course that I created called Exercise Science, uh, and I was upskilling myself in that area uh, through strength and conditioning podcasts, um, which is where I got a lot of the stuff that we were talking about before. Um, anyhow, so I I got curious and I was like, well, let me let me see what what rugby coaching podcasts are out there. I didn't want like the banter and the chat. I listen to them, I enjoy them, um, but I wanted something that's going to help me get better as a coach. Um, that was rugby specific, and after quite a quite a e extensive search, I realised there was no podcast out there that was specifically for rugby. That's not the case now. There's uh, the pandemic has uh, created many many rugby coaching podcasts, uh, which is great. And uh, but it was cool that um, you know there was nothing, and I'm like I'm going to do it. So I, mm -hmm. I spent the summer uh, researching how do you do a podcast. Uh, I didn't I had no clue um, but it was great I really I learned a lot and then I reached out to a couple of podcasters in the SNC uh, industry who gave me feedback and advice um, so I launched it uh, with a with a batch of like five episodes and then I've been pretty consistent uh, once every two weeks and I'm up to but the last two years you know kids uh, work all that kind of stuff have been pretty inconsistent um up to episode 93 now i've learned so much i've forgotten so much and that's where i started thinking okay how am i gonna i want i'm drinking from a fire hose here i want to condense all this information not just for me but for other people who who want to use it as a as a tool and uh because I, I like it's been like the best professional development experience i could mm. ever hope for um nowhere could i have got this uh this this kind of experience and it was all in my basement you know um <laughs> yeah. so i looked into doing some ebooks and stuff like that and i wasn't you know it wasn't really uh feeling it but then you know you and a few others have been pushing you know do a do an online course do an online a video resource online course that uh people can pay for and go through so i'm in the process now of producing that uh it's going to be called evolve rugby uh evolve is an acronym and it just goes through some of the just like the big rocks that i took away from from the podcast uh in running it um you know you know five to ten minute video chapters all in a bunch of modules um worksheets at the end little little shiny certificate uh, of completion at the end uh, and my, my goal is september for that um and i'm pretty on track i've already done some recording uh if you want to talk cringeworthy stuff uh that's uh that's watching yourself on camera um so it's a lot of fun i'm learning more stuff too um my wife's in marketing so so she's helping me out a lot as well and it's just uh it's a fun ride and um yeah closer to september i'll, I'll know more about uh when she's gonna drop oh that's awesome man yeah i'm really excited for you um yeah the uh yeah, this has been a long time coming and you're the OG when it comes to podcasts because <laughs> when we were teaching, you're like, yeah, mate, I'm starting a podcast. So I was like, well, okay, beat it, nerd. Like who listens to podcasts? Beat it, old man. Yeah, like, what are you <laughs> doing, man? Nobody <laughs> listens to those things. And then uh, you're the first podcast I ever listened to. I remember I was driving to Quebec City uh, for- That was my, me, then Joe Rogan. Nice. Yeah, it was like you, that. then Joe. Sequence. I was like, wait, hold on a sec. <laughs> are there other podcasts? I'm like, oh, cool, Joe Rogan. Uh, and then uh, that was the, that was like, the final straw i listened to yours i was like okay cool 
you know, I guess this is what it is. It's kind of like radio, but not live. I get it. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, I'll check out Joe Rogan. And it was, yeah, that moment I was just listening to one of his episodes. And he's like, is, is, is a highlight of your life, like taking a dump at work and listening to something on your phone? I was like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> and he's like, that's not, that's not a way to live, man. And I was like, you're right. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to start. And uh, you know, I was like, well, what do I do? what do I know? You know, like, I don't know much, you know? And then, Mm. um, it took about a year or two for me to kind of bite the bullet and say, okay, I'm going to do this after, you know, I no longer was working at the school or working at, and yeah, that was kind of like, that was the start. It was like, you know, what are we doing with our lives? And the podcast thing kind of led to, like you said, the most important professional development experience of your life. And same, same here. I mean, I never thought I would have talked to Kelly Starrett, you know, like yeah. when I saw him on your podcast, we, I was we like, can call him K-Star. K-Star, you know, K-Star. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's a, well, I was like, wait a, a second. I, I, I remember looking at you. I'm like, you got Kelly Starrett on your podcast? I was like, yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think you, you recorded it at school. Yeah, yeah. I was Snuck like, who off you, into a little dark closet. Yeah, like, who are you talking to? Oh, K- <laughs> Kelly Starrett. I'm like, what do you mean you're talking to Kelly Starrett? Yeah, 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 just have him on the podcast. I was like, what? You can just do that? And then that just opened up my mind to like, oh my God, like, you can just talk mm. to people and they're willing to come on a show. Um, yeah, so I thank you for that. They want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah oh, man. My pleasure, man. It's, it's awesome seeing your journey and how, how it's progressing. And, you know, you're, you're way ahead of me in, in terms of uh, your, your branding and your, your products and your, your courses. And you, you've got, you know, something coming soon. And, um, yeah, I, we can, we can, we can share the learning over a few cold ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. Once, <laughs> Once we, once our patio is open again, once our terrace yeah. is open again, it's going to be so yeah. sweet. Can't the first, wait. The first hour is super productive, and then, uh, and <laughs> yeah. then it gets a little Ours go all, after. They all they all follow the same trend, like super productive, yeah. and then <laughs> two or three beers in, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, Andy, I'm super excited for that course. Um, I know you don't have, I don't think you have any links or anything just yet, but no, they can go yet, to. No. Yeah. Um, can they go to your uh, podcast website? Is that going to be updated, or are yeah. we doing a full rebrand here? Um, I think where, where going, do people follow we're you? fully we're fully changing it, but yeah, you follow uh, the Rugby Coaches Corner Podcast uh, dot com, I think it is, uh, and then Rugby Coaches CNR, which I'm sure you're going to uh, throw in the show notes, as all good podcast hosts do. Yes. Um, and yeah, I'll, as stuff progresses, I'll, I'll be throwing out uh, little snippets of how the course is coming along and uh, some promo stuff and that. So right on, yeah, prolific Bumped. tweeter, prolific tweeter, and like all, I guess, dudes that are like past thirty five years old, we all have a hard time remembering what our handles are on social media. <laughs> yeah, no. If you ask me, I'm like, I don't know, just type in Dave Morrow. I think yeah. you'll find something. Yeah. I, I have no yeah. idea. So I'll make sure to get the right ones in the show notes so people can follow cool. you on Twitter. Follow me on Twi- yeah. uh, on Twitter at Heart to Kill Pod, um, and um, you'll you'll find uh, some some updates uh, for Andy as well. And uh, he's got a great Twitter feed as well uh, for any of you guys that are looking for uh, rugby news, rugby coaches corner news. Um, you've interviewed bird watching how- news. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You've got a hell of a lot of good guests. Like, it, uh, so you know, anybody here? Like, we, I'm sure. Yeah, there's. A, you know, we've got a, a strong enough rugby sub community in the forces here in Canada because mm. they kind of go hand mm. in hand. You know, it's, a, it's an aggressive sport and it's an aggressive mm. job. So, um, I know a handful that are um, that are in both worlds. So, uh, definitely start following Big Andy on Sweet. the interwebs. And uh, yeah, folks. Uh, so. Andy, always a pleasure, man. And um, I think we should yeah, uh, we should we should do it. We should do another uh, another collaboration on the on the, our respective podcast again at some point. And yeah. uh, dude, enjoy the enjoy the rest of the yeah. day. Uh, we're going into a long weekend. Can't wait. Um, and then you know, sky's the limit on your course and uh, continued success on the podcast. And folks, thanks for listening. And don't forget, train hard, fight easy. Peace. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can find out more about training, nutrition, and mindset at DaveMorrow.net. Be sure to like us on Facebook and Instagram at DaveMorrowPT. And don't forget, strong people are hard to kill.